Good morning. Oh, there we go. All right, I hope everyone's highly caffeinated and ready for the day. You're on it? Okay. Um, I'm Marjorie Clifton. I am the executive director for the Center for Safe Internet Pharmacies. And we are so grateful for you taking the time to be here this morning for a very important day of conversation. Um, when CSIP was founded in 2011 uh, by a lot of the companies in this room, they include Google and Microsoft and Oath and Facebook and MasterCard and Discover and American Express and PayPal and UPS. It was kind of an unexpected gathering because we had a lot of competitors in one space, but we came together looking at how to deal with illicit pharmacies that were starting to appear online. And I think in the seven years to follow, we never would have expected the spaces we would be led to, uh, and that is today looking at the opioid crisis. And I think it's something that has taken everyone in every corner of government and healthcare by surprise. And it's been an interesting personal journey as well, because as I've gotten to know everyone on our board, and even standing in the rooms uh, today, I hear people's personal stories with addiction. Uh, it's in almost every family, or it's touched almost every family. And I think the conundrum of the opioid crisis is that addiction acts so differently with every family, with every individual, and it has a lot of us wanting to understand and find answers. And sitting here in Washington, D.C., um, I think what is frustrating and really hard for me, having experienced this in my own family, is seeing finger pointing and seeing politics and seeing things come to play that should not be because what we're facing is gonna require an all hands on deck approach. It's gonna require us understanding all the complexity um, and somewhat maddening aspects of both addiction and, uh, and how people operate. And so I'm very pleased uh, that we have today a lot of people in the room who come at this and understand it from a lot of different angles. Um, people who uh, work with people experiencing addiction on a daily basis. We have scientists, we have researchers, um, we have leaders in our healthcare institutions. And a lot of people ask, and, and so the technology companies, what, what part are they here to play? And I think what I am heartened by and excited by is that in the technology space, I think what our companies have recognized is that they have the power to connect. They have the power to be a platform. And one of the reasons that tech has sort of stepped forward wanting to join the conversation and continue to be helpful in the ways they can is um, to use their platforms in the best way they can because this will require all hands on deck. There is no one player that can solve the opioid crisis. But to do it well, we have to sort of put all of our our shields and our, our lenses down and be able to hear one another, be able to understand all the aspects of, of how we got to where we are today. Um, and Beth Macy, who's here today, had a quote that I thought, I don't know, it spoke to me really, really well. So I'm gonna read it to her, her uh, in her words. She said, there are systems in place to address the problems of the opioid crisis, but none of them are working together. The biggest barrier to collaboration is the fact that everyone is approaching the problem too rigidly, excuse me, too rigidly through the lens in which they are paid. I thought that was pretty profound. So for personal reasons, for professional reasons, for every reason which is making our country better and saving what are now millions of lives we're losing in the opioid crisis, today is really important. And so I hope you can hear it and join it as a conversation, because that is what this is intended to be. Um, it's intended to be how can we help and where can we use our expertise? Because as tech, we are not physicians, we are not law enforcement, um, so there are ways that we can look at the problem, but we need all of these other areas uh, to help us get there. So thank you, thank you for being here, for your time, and for caring enough to, to do the work with us. Um, I'm gonna kick off the day with an amazing speaker we have here. He asked me not to read his whole bio, which makes me love him even more, because we could, we could wait. I want to hear everything that's coming out of his mouth, and I think that time is more precious. Um, we have Dr. Wilson Compton. 
He is the deputy director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, formerly a uh, professor of psychiatry and director of the Masters of Psychiatric Epidemiology at Washington University in St. Louis. And the thing that Dr. Uh, Compton also wanted me to point out was that what NIH is about is innovation. And that he was so excited by the opportunity to be in the room with other innovators because the only way we are going to solve this is by innovating and collaboration. So thank you so much for being here. I think I'm wired for, I am wired for sound. I can, I can even hear myself. Uh, it, it, it really is a pleasure to be here today. And I, I have a broad theme for you in terms of innovation, which is what NIH is all about. We're about science being solutions to the health problems that our public faces. And there, is, uh, there are a few problems more severe right now than the opioid crisis facing America. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about is a little bit of the data that helps us understand this crisis, how it spreads, some of the underlying causes, and I'll emphasize for you broad economic and environmental causes as at least one of the major elements in this uh, uh, multi-part crisis. And then we'll focus a little bit about what we're doing as a government and some from sort of a broad policy perspective and research perspective to do something about this. And then I'll end with a couple of suggestions and I hope some ideas for you all to think through. As we start, what I have for you are, 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 are maps that show uh, a, a burning fire across the country. So even without knowing exactly what this is about, you can immediately appreciate from the color coding that CDC did of all the counties in the US that the overdose deaths have increased everywhere in the US. That's one of the things you learn from these maps is that over the last 20 years, we've seen a huge increase everywhere. But you also immediately notice that it's not evenly spread and that there are some parts that are even more heavily hit than others. I also am pretty struck by even way before we were paying any attention, there were the sparks starting this fire in certain parts of the country. So there were a handful of public health officials paying attention, but nobody was really listening to them. Uh, back uh, uh, almost 20 years ago. But I think it's amazing when we look in retrospect that there are opportunities to intervene early that we might have, that we've missed across the years. Now the number of deaths is staggering. I have the 2016 data. It looks from preliminary data from CDC that the 2017 data shows another 15% increase. Uh, and what is missing from this is that each one of the individuals represented in that broad summary has family members and loved ones that cared about them. That is so much devastation that's represented all across the United States in this very dry statistic that, I, of course, I'm an epidemiologist, so I count numbers. That's what kind of gets my brain excited. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that behind these numbers are, in, are unfathomable and uncountable numbers of, family, uh, of individuals and families that are affected by this, whether it's in their families, as I've suggested, in their neighborhoods, in their communities that are impacted by all of these deaths. Now, another way to look at this is the opioid crisis is uh, the most recent version of what we've been facing in terms of overdose deaths. And it really represents about a 30-year increasing trend. This is a remarkable graph because it really shows, in some ways, an exponential growth. So it's not just been increasing evenly, but it actually has been accelerating over the last 15 years. And that's something we don't completely understand why it's accelerating. Also, for the most part, in public health, you see flu curves. Every year, they go up. And then we sort of hold our breath, waiting for them to level off and come down. Is this coming down? Nope. There, it might be some indication uh, in the last year or so that we are seeing a little bit of a, a decline in the increases, but we certainly aren't seeing any, what I would call, any glimmers in terms of the broad numbers in terms of improvements. Uh, we were hopeful about five years ago that we might see improvements as prescription opioids took a little bit of a breather, and unfortunately, the marketplace took over and brought heroin into many parts of the country that never had it before. And then fentanyl is a particularly potent poison that has been devastating communities. So I, I would be concerned about innovation, not in this room, but outside this room that may drive this epidemic in untold ways in the future. So we need to be open to not just tried and true methods, but also thinking about new approaches as it shifts. 
Now, I've already mentioned to you, you know, sort of these three parts, so let's look at them a little bit in some detail. If this had been about four or five years ago, I would have only focused on the prescription opioids. But as that began to level out, we actually started seeing heroin increasing. Uh, this is driven both by somewhat l less access to prescription opioids for those who are heavily addicted, but also progression of addiction in so many. And the availability of heroin in communities and in ways that we'd never seen before in terms of retail marketing of heroin, easier access in terms of uh, uh, call-up delivery services for it, also, many uh, communities that never had a heroin trade before suddenly became markets. As drug dealers figured out that the 12 million or so people that misuse prescription opioids, if you can convince them to try heroin, will find that it does the same thing to their brains. And it often is cheaper. Now, there is a bias against heroin, so most people don't make that transition, thank goodness. But once people start down that pathway, the progression is, is uh, ex a, a, a phenomenal and devastating. Now, what we've seen, and I'll go over this in some detail, is the same issue around fentanyl. This is, I put fentanyl in quotes, because fentanyl is a medication that we're very grateful to have in, uh, uh, in surgery suites for end-of-life care for cancer patients. What we're talking about mostly are fentanyl and fentanyl-like compounds that are manufactured in factories mostly in China and then exported to the US using the postal service and commercial carriers. So it uses typical distribution routes. And because it's so potent, it's able to be smuggled quite readily. One way I like to think of it, I'm a cook, so I like to use cooking analogies. If I had a cup of heroin and poured it out, you'd go, oh my god. You can imagine that being divided up into glassine ampules, you know, little envelopes and sold on the street, causing a lot of devastation. A cup would be you know, a little mound of powder there. How much fentanyl would be about the equivalent of that cup of heroin? One teaspoon, one little teaspoon, like the teaspoon of baking powder instead of the cup of flour. Uh, that small amount is the same amount of devastation. And so that's kind of, that sort of clicked for me. It's like, oh, even I could figure out how you might smuggle a teaspoon of something. Uh, and that's what we're talking about, are these small quantities that can produce the devastation in the community. Uh, I, I've highlighted for you economics and environmental availability. What drove the original crisis was the phenomenal excess prescribing, uh, where we now have well over uh, uh, 200 million or more than one prescription for every adult in the US. That's prescription, not tablets, in the US. Uh, one way to look at this is this sort of map that sort of excel accentuates uh, the uh, uh, geographic dispersion of opioids, of painkillers around the globe. And so you see the US, Canada, Australia as bloated geographic areas. So this could be, this isn't the obesity map. This is uh, a map of the relative availability of opioids. But I also want to point out that you see some parts of the globe that almost ha have almost no access to opioids. So while we are talking about excess availability and the problems that can cause, I really would not want to have general surgery or some problems in some parts of the globe where you didn't have access to these life-sustaining medications in the right circumstances. Now, economics have been driving heroin as well. I've suggested this too. This is just one way to look at the price of heroin over the last 20 years, where it's been relatively low and stable over the last 20 years. Uh, fentanyl is the next issue where, where economics play a role. Counterfeit products broaden the at-risk population. We're seeing fentanyl actually put, uh, uh, included in the supply of methamphetamine and cocaine in some jurisdictions. I was pretty surprised by that. I thought that meant that drug users were intentionally mixing it, but no, it turns out that drug dealers are mixing fentanyl into the illicit drug supply and in the process poisoning uh, other drug users who really didn't think they were uh, at risk for an opioid overdose. Driving this is economics, and I'm, I'm thrilled that I'm, I purloined this graphic from the Wall Street Journal uh, because what they reminded us is that something like $1,000 worth of fentanyl purchased over the internet or some other way uh, can be then uh, uh, brought to the US and sold on the streets for something like a million dollars. So that is a huge profit margin that can drive phenomenal amounts of behavior. Even if some of it gets busted and doesn't get through, you can lose a lot of product along the way and still cause a lot of devastation. All right, I've highlighted for you the de deaths associated with these products. The overdose deaths are, of course, 
the most devastating consequence and what's brought us all to this room and to, to, to the, the focus of our attention these days. But it's not just overdose deaths. There's also in, uh, uh, other affected populations. This is just a, uh, showing you the increases in uh, opioid exposure during pregnancy. So this is increases in neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, babies who are born in withdrawal. So they uh, uh, suffer complications because of the withdrawal from what they've been, on, been uh, receiving uh, during pregnancy. So this causes both increased admissions as well as increasing costs for our country. It's not just neonatal opioid exposure. It's not just overdose deaths, but there's also infectious disease. Because of injection drug use being a major route of use of these substances, we're seeing hepatitis C increasing. We saw the outbreak of HIV in Indiana a couple of years ago. We are seeing outbreaks of HIV associated with these same risk factors in other communities around the country now. CDC estimates that there's over 200 counties around the country with a similar risk profile who are just unfortunately uh, uh, hotbeds for the potential spread of these infectious diseases. We've launched a series of research projects to try to bring care into the rural areas that seem particularly vulnerable to these infectious diseases. Uh, that's not easy to do. How you bring health care to populations that are remote, may not have much of a health system at all, they may not have a public health system, is not easy to do. And so that's why we're engaging this with a series of partners, with our federal partners, including the Appalachian Regional Commission. And I highlight this because that's an economic development group. Why are they supporting a health research product? Well, that's because of the intersection of health and economics in the communities that they support. Realizing that by addressing the opioid crisis in the Appalachian area, we may actually help the economics of that region as well. We are approaching this from a multi-pronged strategy in terms of prevention, better pain management, saving lives acutely with uh, distribution of naloxone, better access to treatment and prevention and recovery services, as well as a big focus on research. Now, I've got a few more slides, but I'm going to zip through them because I want to end and give you all a couple of suggestions and then maybe if not have a chance for questions now, at least I'll be around for the rest of the morning to talk to you. This is an important part of our data collection at NIDA, the National Drug Early Warning System. This uses a group, a, a basically a social network of researchers and public health officials to inform each other and us about emerging drug trends. We engaged in a hotspot study in New Hampshire, and I want to highlight this for you because of a couple of findings. Lack of access to services was a key factor. But in addition, one of the things that really surprised me is that some drug users are intentionally seeking out fentanyl. Most of us assume that a product that kills its customers is not welcome by the users of that product. Not always the case, because sometimes what a death signals to some individuals is, oh my goodness, that's very potent. So maybe I want to seek that, because I might get high in a way that I haven't experienced in a long time from what I usually use. That's an unfortunate reality in terms of the, 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 the mental processes in some people with addiction. It's not all, and drug addicts will shape their behavior, knowing that fentanyl's in their marketplace. Uh, but this is an unfortunate reality. Uh, I'll skip this one. I'm going to highlight for you some of the education we've been doing both at NIDA, and in particular, I'll highlight for you some broad-based education around pain evaluation and treatment that we've been engaged in with all of NIH. It turns out that doctors aren't very good at recognizing and treating pain effectively. And so when you say pain, and I have something called a painkiller, and all I have to do is write a prescription for it, that became an all-purpose easy solution, even if that wasn't necessarily the best approach. So one of the ways we've been doing this is with a formal educational processes to help clinicians do a better job of evaluating and treating pain without resorting to opioids. The CDC has done a wonderful job in promoting uh, guidelines for the treatment of chronic non-cancer uh, 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 non pain without using opioids or minimizing the use of opioids in those situations, and that's made a difference. What we've seen is a modest decline in opioid prescriptions. The rates are still much higher in the U.S. than any other country and way too high, but this is at least a hopeful sign that our education and outreach is having an impact on the medical community. We see overdose intervention being another key element, and I'm thrilled that the Surgeon General issued an advisory. We actually saw a giant spike in the number of retail prescriptions for naloxone after uh, uh, the Surgeon General came out with this advisory. So we appreciate these public health outreach work from, from our, our colleagues. 
I'm going to mention to you also some prevention activity that hasn't gotten as much attention. Did you know that middle school interventions like the Strengthening Families for 10 to 14 year olds, Strengthening Families Program 10 to 14, can have an impact over eight and 10 years and reduce the onset of prescription opioid and other prescription drug misuse? I think that's kind of remarkable, that if we provide a protective shield on our early adolescents, it'll stick with them for, in this case, up to 10 years later. We haven't taken this evidence and then translated that into widespread use of these kind of effective prevention programs, and maybe that's something that you all can help us with, is figuring out how to convince communities and the public to take advantage of prevention and also treatment that works. I think we're losing the next group to get mic'd up when I'm all done. The uh, 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 medications are our next key element here, and I, I'm going to show you why this is so important. If we look at the uh, something like two and a half million people that have an opioid use disorder that have addiction to opioids, well, what happens here? Only a, less than a third of them we estimate are engaged in care. Even a smaller number end up starting on medication treatment. Very few of them stick with that treatment, and an even smaller number appear to have long-term abstinence. So while these medications can work, if people have access to them, if people take them consistently, they're not a panacea, and we certainly see that they haven't reached their maximum potential for affecting public health. So what are we at NIDA doing about this? Well, one of the exciting places that we've been working is in emergency departments. Drug users show up with all sorts of problems in emergency departments, whether that's an overdose or an injury, or come in seeking drug treatment and trying to get help. Well, the emergency departments get tired of simply referring people to the treatment program, so in a very innovative practice at Yale University, they started administering and starting people on buprenorphine right there in the emergency department. And what they found was that the drug users who were started on medication right then and there I guess this isn't too much of a surprise, but they were a whole lot more likely to be engaged in care in the next few weeks compared to those that were referred to treatment the next day. We see criminal justice settings being a very important target for this, where we've been uh, working with researchers to get medications uh, embedded into probation and parole. And indeed, when, you put, when, when medications are used, we see the outcomes markedly improved. Uh, we've been conducting studies that compare the different types of medications, whether that's an opiate blocking agent or an opioid substitution treatment. And indeed, we see that uh, uh, once they're started on those, if somebody can succeed in starting on them, that they look like they're about equally effective. But we do see some additional benefit, particularly from the opioid substitution treatments, buprenorphine and methadone. Finally, we're working on new medications. So a new medication was just approved following some work that we helped support for easing withdrawal symptoms. So at least getting people into treatment, that's one way to do it. Now, I, I'll end with a couple of slides on what we're doing at NIH with the additional resources that Congress provided uh, starting, believe it or not, I'm not in 2018 anymore. I'm in 2019 because I work for the federal government. Our new year was October 1. But starting in FY18, uh, so uh, just a few months ago, Congress allocated significant funds to the NIH, uh, $500 million, to support research focusing on pain as the upstream driver of this crisis. Can't we do a better job of without using opioids? And then the second part is to focus on the addiction issues, whether that's withdrawal uh, uh, treatment, whether that's opioid addiction treatment and saving lives more effectively by getting naloxone out and other treatments to uh, prevent people from uh, uh, dying of an overdose, which stops your breathing. We have multiple projects in this area, and I'm going to skip through these because I, I really want to end with a couple of ideas for you. I, you know, I was introduced by saying that we are the innovators in terms of biomedical health, and that is what our job is at NIH, is to support research that will transform the lives of all of us and all of our friends and neighbors. So how can we think about this, and what could we see technology helping us with? How could you all help us with this? Well, I highlighted for you our early warning system, the National Drug Early Warning System. You all may have access to remarkable amounts of data that can be an early warning sign. I bet people are chatting about drug use in communities and locations that 
we will only hear about when there are large number of deaths in that area or other problems. Might there be ways to take advantage of some of the data you all have to give us early warning signs so that we can implement prevention effectively in those communities? I showed you that terrible data around how few people get into treatment and stay with treatment. To a certain extent, can you help us change the paradigm around treatment? People think that they go to treatment, they get better, and they live happily ever after. Well, guess what? This is about behavior change and memories and long-term behavior. It's kind of like if you were on a diet and you lose 10 pounds and then you say, oh, I'm fixed. Now I can go back to eating french fries and cake. Nope, you need to change your behavior over the long haul. Well, how can we sell that long-term notion both to the public and to clinicians? I also think you all may have a role in helping us figure out how to get people into treatment when they need it. And I also think maybe even warning people before they see a need for treatment. There's an awful lot of glamorization and dramatization of drug use uh, in, by the public. Um, we see this when it comes to alcohol. We used to see this when it came to tobacco. We've done a pretty good job of unglamorizing tobacco, despite there being a long history of that. Can we do the same thing when it comes to illicit drugs in terms of unglamorizing it and making sure that we use those messages and that evidence of people using substances that we see all over social media as perhaps a flag that we need to intervene and do something? I'm not sure how we would do this. We haven't invest, we, we have some researchers working in the social media space, but not that much. And so I, I look forward to an opportunity to brainstorm with you and see this as a growing area of scientific inquiry. That is my goal, is to use science as solutions. So we'll take the good ideas that we develop here, and I hope to partner with you to see to it that we study them and find out, well, does it do the good? We hope it will. And if not, how do we tweak it so it does a better job? Process of continuous quality improvement that you all are very familiar with, I think we need to apply here as well. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much. And I actually think we might have some of those answers and interesting conversation coming. Um, I want to welcome to the stage uh, Beth Macy. And for those of you who have not read her book, I will say it has been the single most transformative piece of literature that I have read that has helped me understand the opioid crisis. I told her I've had her, I felt like I've been with her for the past three months because I've had her audio book in my car every day. But I've had to listen and re-listen because it is so chock full of history um, and an understanding from every corner of this crisis where it's coming from. She is the author, as I said, of Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company that Addicted America, and also Factory Man and True Vine. She just comes out of three decades of work she's done reporting in the same Virginia communities um, as her prior books. And Dope Sick really unpacks the social problems of our time around the opioid crisis, the landscape of job loss, and just greed and stigma that intersected with our opioid crisis. And Beth is a very... Um, well-awarded uh, uh, um, author as well. She's won more than a dozen National Journalism Awards. Um, she is also a frequent speaker and teacher and essayist and has been published in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, Oprah, and Parade. Um, so thank you for being here and, and for the things that you have to offer to this conversation. And also on this panel, we have Fred Munch, who is uh, president and CEO of the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. And I have heard Fred speak before, and um, he adds so much wonder to this conversation. Some of the most amazing things Fred is doing, and he also um, serves as the primary clinical, previously served as the primary clinical and operational development lead at the Partnership's Helpline, and most recently was the lead on developing Northwell Health's beta digital alcohol reduction coaching program. Um, he also is the principal investigator in research studies and technology to combat addiction and impulsivity uh, through current and previous grants from NIH, um, from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But um, to give you a translation of that, he is creating technology that helps predict uh, addictive behavior in people. And I think that even in my own family, every, we're so excited about what that means. Um, so thank you. 
And then finally, we have Justin Luke Riley. And Justin is the president and CEO of Young People in Recovery. Um, he is, it says that you're 30 years old, so um, that's great. He's a Scorpio. He likes long bucks on the beach. <laughs> That's young, that's good, that, just so we know what the benchmark is. Uh, Justin has been in, uh, in long-term recovery since uh, 2007. And, I, and he brings so much to this conversation with his honesty and openness about that. Uh, he also graduated cum laude from Honors and Leadership Program at the University of Colorado in Denver in 2013, and recently completed his executive MBA at the University of Colorado. Congratulations. Um, he also was a former organizational development consultant and a youth and community engagement pastor in Denver. And my gosh, everyone's bios are amazing. He is also the White House Champion of Change Award recipient and was recently featured uh, as one of the four social entrepreneurs advancing the nationwide recovery movement in Forbes. And he also sits on the National Advisory Council, Council for Substance Abuse uh, Mental Health Administration and the Executive Committee for the Coalition to Stop Opioid Overdose. So we have a lot of expertise on this panel. So thank you guys, come on up. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Really thank Mike and Adam and Google for inviting me here today to talk about my book. Uh, they asked me to sort of tee it, tee it up by telling stories. And then we're going to have a fireside chat and get a little more deeper into um, what Fred and Justin have going on as well and take questions at the end. So um, this is probably the 35th time that I've talked about the book since it came out August 7th. And so I know from experience that there are people in the room who have lost people they love to this epidemic. So I just wanted to begin by acknowledging that and saying I'm sorry for your loss. We lost 72,000 people last year to drug overdose. Every one of them a tragedy, not just them, but their families and their friends. My job in writing Dope Sick um, really was to mobilize people to care. And I did what I've done as a longtime newspaper reporter, reporting from the same place in Western Virginia for three decades. I did it by getting close to the families and the first responders, the people on the ground. So Dope Sick is a national look at the crisis. I tell it uh, using Virginia sort of a microcosm of America uh, from the beginning of the epidemic in 1996 when OxyContin was introduced and so was pain as the fifth vital sign. People bring me things to my events, uh, like this clipboard, uh, to, uh, and that's in central Appalachia, you saw some of those hotspots, to cities and suburbs in the late aughts and early teens. Uh, I write about a place, um, an upper middle class subdivision called Hidden Valley in Roanoke, Virginia, where I live. And then more recently, because there's no place in the country where this epidemic isn't, I wrote about once idyllic farm towns where heroin is now a thing. And my challenge uh, telling this story, which goes back 20 years, is how to impose not just hope but order on a chaotic and despairing story. I was worried as somebody who's had addiction in her family going back at least four generations uh, that I would get depressed. And my friend quoted Mr. Rogers to me because it's never a bad idea to quote Mr. Rogers. <laughs> he said, follow the helpers, find the helpers. And that's what I did. Another friend of mine said, picture you've gone on this hike, this expedition to Antarctica and your job now is to tell what you saw there and why the people you went on this journey with didn't make it back. And that was, that was helpful to me. The book begins with me visiting a drug dealer in prison. He's been sentenced for 23 years for his role in bringing heroin to a once idyllic farm town. And I was asked by a mother of a 19-year-old football player, former football player, Jesse Bolstridge, that's him in the picture, to figure out why it was her only son died uh, with a needle in his arm on someone else's bathroom floor. She said multiple times, I thought it was just pills. So was it the illegal drug dealer 
who'd made a marked presence on the town where they lived, as police insisted, or was it her lack of knowledge about evidence-based treatment? If she understood better, she said to me, she could share and protect other families from it happening to them too. And I believe that until we understand how we reach this place, America is gonna remain a place where it's much easier to get addicted than it is to get treatment for addiction. So to answer your questions, I started peeling the layers of the onion from interviewing drug dealers who seeded bulk heroin in a tiny town where Jesse lived, going all the way back to the introduction of OxyContin in 1996. The opioid crisis first broke out in places like central Appalachia, rural fishing communities, Machias, Maine, places where doctors were already prescribing more opioids for legitimate pain and workplace injuries, coal miners, also places where factories and mines were shutting down, uh, fishermen, furniture workers, but OxyContin was much stronger than those other competing immediate release opioids, and it turned a lot of people into non-functioning people. The company hired an army of sales reps and they targeted areas that had high rates of disability because the company bought data showing which doctors prescribed the most opioids. They paid some 5,000 doctors, nurses, and pharmacists to become paid speakers for the company to promote the, no promote the notion that what we were really experiencing was an epidemic of untreated pain. By 2001, the narrative had flipped. For 100 years, we knew that it was only safe to prescribe opioids for end of life, cancer, very severe pain. But by 2001, general practitioners were now prescribing more opioids than cancer doctors were. And people like Arnold Fane McCauley, he was a low coal miner out of far southwest Virginia, pictured here, who had been injured several times in his coal mining year and had always been able to return to work when he was on the lower dose opioids, he lost everything he owned. He lost his family, he lost his farm, uh, he lost everything. He sold treasures, family heirlooms to get this drug when he couldn't get it anymore. 75 years old, he ends up dead in a field, murdered for a drug dealer, murdered because of a drug deal gone bad. He'd been sent to rehab five times, always abstinence only rehab, never medication assisted treatment. He told his doctor that drug became my God. So Fane McCauley and people like that, he died in 01. I think of him as sort of the canary in the coal mine <coughs> but because he and others were in uh, politically unimportant places. This really allowed the epidemic to fester and grow. We're talking almost 20 years ago. Four out of five people who are addicted to heroin started out abusing uh, prescription opioids. This is uh, so did young Tess Henry. She's a 26-year-old uh, waitress when I met her and a young mother. Uh, the daughter of a hospital surgeon and a nurse uh, who'd grown up in the nicest section of Roanoke where I live, had a vacation home on Baldhead Island, North Carolina. She became addicted in 2012 when she was prescribed two 30-day opioids at an urgent care center for a simple case of bronchitis. I said, how did you know you were addicted? She'd have put my symptoms into Google. And I said, holy crap, I'm addicted. I watched over the course of two and a half years, I watched her bounce from motherhood to jail, to rehab, domestic violence shelters, homelessness, prostitution. Her biggest hurdles were always when she would lose her access to buprenorphine or medication assisted treatment. Despite all the scientific evidence supporting its use for re reducing relapse and overdose death and criminal behavior and stigma, I took her to NA meetings and no one would sponsor her at those meetings because she was on buprenorphine and that was considered replacing one drug with another. Even her own siblings wouldn't support her in the final years of her life because they wrongly believed she needed to hit bottom. And in an era of fentanyl, it's not safe to hit bottom. It takes the average heroin addicted person eight years and four to five treatment attempts just to get one year of sobriety. That's from John Kelly at Harvard. 
Tess herself believed that abstinence only rehab was her best shot, even though she'd been stable on it during periods. And even though her best friend overdosed and died after being accepted into an abstinence only rehab and forced weaning herself off of buprenorphine against her doctor's wishes. All these things led Tess back to heroin and death by what I've come to call patient abandonment. Long doctor waiting lists that proliferate, especially in states, doctors, not enough doctors are willing to become wavered to prescribe buprenorphine. So there's a guy in the coal fields, a doctor who has a two year waiting list. In Roanoke, where I live, three week waiting list. Um, there are, we're starting to see better examples as um, the gentleman before us just showed where they're starting to give it out in ERs. But in most of rural America, where overdose rates are highest, it's really long. It's really hard to get. This led Tess to a faraway city for another, yet another abstinence-only rehab in Las Vegas, where she was sent last year for treatment and ultimately, after she relapsed there, to operate amid a world of prostitutions and drug gangs. Like most users, Tess was a middleman. She sold drugs to fuel her own habit. She prostituted for drugs, too. She hoped to get home, she told her mother and me, to regain custody of her young son, who she loved so much. On December 22nd, she texted her mom, I just got on Suboxone. She was trying to be able to take a bus and not be dope sick on her ride, not having diarrhea and vomiting and sweats to make her back to Virginia. She prostituted to pay for her doctor to get this medication. So look at this beautiful child. Like the farmer, just like the farmer and the coal miner, Fane Macaulay, I, sure, I assure you, she did not set out to become a heroin addict. But she ended up the same way Mr. McCauley did. She ended up here in this dumpster about 100 yards from a homeless encampment in Las Vegas. Her body was found murdered uh, by another heroin addicted person who was foraging for cans to sell so he could buy more heroin. We later learned she'd spent her final weeks living in the corners of casinos in an abandoned minivan her murder remains unsolved. Tess used technology to diagnose herself with opioid use disorder the first time she felt the pain of dope sickness. She used technology to post ads on prostitution websites like Backpage.com. This is one of them. She used burner phones, and she would use Wi-Fi near the university in Las Vegas to post ads on Backpage with pictures posed in a trailer belonging to her pimp. The first prosecutor I ever interviewed about burgeoning heroin crisis in 2012, the first one to really kind of make the front page news with a suburban kid that was about to go to prison for, for five years told me when he got that kid's phone, there were 50 other kids he was using and dealing with. He said, that's when I couldn't sleep at night. So technology has eased, not created, but it has eased the expanding web of opioid supply. How can it help abate the problem? I'm so grateful to you all for taking these really hard questions on. Tess used Facebook Messenger, Gmail, other online communications, including burner phones to set up drug deals, and even to communicate with me. This is our last back and forth via Facebook Messenger. I had given a reading before the book came out in which I, uh, and then I posted on Facebook that I had talked about her story in an early draft of the book. And she got on and she wrote, I helped make that book. She really wanted people to know how hard it had been for her to access treatment. She knew she still had a long road ahead of her. She could get heroin in the wash, and that's the wash in the second picture. That's the homeless encampment. She even got on Suboxone at the end, but she couldn't make it out to the city syringe exchange program because the only place the city of Las Vegas would allow a syringe exchange program um, and that's a place where users can go to get testing and treatment and clean needles so they're not spreading hepatitis C, which Tess also had by now. 
It was on the outskirts of the city, and she would have had to take a bus 40 minutes to get there. So none of these things were available to her. In Roanoke, Tessa's hometown, I'm currently locked uh, public horns with the city police chief who does not believe in opening a syringe exchange. The state of Virginia passed laws allowing it two years ago. Only one locality in the entire state has one because the police, too often the police officers won't sign off on it. And um, in the few states where we are starting to see slight reductions in overdose deaths, so those are Rhode Island, Vermont, Massachusetts, these are early Medicaid expansion states. Um, and also places that have syringe exchanges, which are places where users can go to get referrals for treatment. These were all beginning to turn their overdose death numbers down. So we know what <coughs> works, we just, don't, we just lack the political will to make it happen. Lastly, this is uh, Tess's Medicaid card. This arrived four months after her death. It arrived in the home of one of her suspected pimps. And even though she was living homeless and shooting up six times a day, she knew she needed treatment to hepatitis and MAT. She had gone through, can you imagine living homeless and doing all the paperwork still to get approved for Medicaid? When her mother saw this card, um, she just wept. She was trying so hard to get home and to get better. So there was a great obit recently for an addiction treatment pioneer, Herbert. Kleber, who quit a drug czar office, frustrated that most of the billions of dollars earmarked for the nation's failed war on drugs was still going to law enforcement and not to treatment. Asked how he remained upbeat, and I've been asking mm -hmm. these guys, how do, how, how do, what, where's the hope? Where do we get the hope? They, they have better answers than I do. Um, he said, he quoted the Talmud, the day is short, the task is difficult, it's not our duty to finish it, but we are forbidden not to try. So what can you as corporate tech giants and government leaders do to promote the notion that people with opioid use disorder deserve treatment no matter what state they live in? We only have 33 states that have passed the Medicaid expansion. As one of Tessa's fellow addicted homeless people living in the wash in Las Vegas told me, the government, by approving OxyContin, got us hooked. And once we're hooked, now we're addicts and pieces of shit. I don't understand that. I applaud your willingness to tackle this issue, and I ask that you think about this. If social media platforms send me ads that hit the center of my brain and that spookily also seem based on my verbal conversations while my phone is in my purse, then why can't we harness that power for good? And, and I, you all are taking great steps with that. And um, I'm going to pass the slides over to Fred, but I just wanted to end by telling you about this necklace that Tessa's mom gave me um, about a month after her death. It's got a poem that represented the way she felt about her son, her young son, who she was trying so hard to get back and get. Uh, it's got an E.E. E. Cummings poem called I Carry Your Heart in My Heart. And inside of it, I have a picture of Tess with her rescue dogs that she loved. And I put James Baldwin on the other side because he said, not everything that's faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you for being willing to face it. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, and uh, uh, bringing a narrative to the story. Uh, we deal with a lot of statistics. Uh, but, but bringing faces, making it real, uh, it is something we do in our day-to-day -day lives. But uh, not everybody sees what we do, so, so thank you for bringing that to the world. Um, uh, as, as Beth was saying, uh, J Justin, Beth, and I went out to breakfast this morning, and she asked us how we keep the hope up. Um, and and uh, Justin and I, I think, had a pretty universal response is because we see recovery. We see the opportunities. We see the opportunities um, that, that, that are available to individuals, to families, to make a difference. Uh, and uh, the, at the partnership, for example, what we do is we support the supporters. So we support the families that are supporting those struggling with addiction. 
So we empower them to make changes in their own families to then empower those individuals struggling. And just like Dr. Compton said, uh, uh, those programs like strengthening families improve outcomes and prevention, but there's also programs that you can just work with a family member, not the individual struggling, and you will improve outcomes. You'll increase treatment engagement. You'll increase overall recovery outcomes, and you'll help the family that's struggling. Um, as, as the president and CEO of the partnership, it's been, it's been my goal and our goal to support families. Uh, and I'm also in recovery from heroin addiction, so I know what it's like to let your family down. I know the shame, I know the horrible guilt that comes with that, and I know the difference between when my family engaged with me with love, that doesn't mean enabling, just engaging with love, setting the right boundaries, versus saying, I can't deal with this anymore. Uh, and the difference between a phone call uh, from a loving family member or friend saying, I love you, that's it, that's it, I love you, I believe in you, versus not receiving that phone call is tremendous. And uh, this is where I see the opportunity. Uh, Beth is a reporter. She sees the devastation. Uh, I'm a psychologist and in recovery, and I see the opportunity. And this is where I think we have the opportunity to change the narrative. Um, there are certain things that might be out of our reach, but there are certain things within our reach. And as a technologist, I am one of those people who sees the opportunity. And I've been working with lots of people in this room to make those opportunities a reality. Uh, and, and it's been happening for, for several years. I do want to highlight a, a couple of the ways right now um, we are using technology to intervene. And, and um, Beth said something important, that her and Tess were communicating via uh, Facebook Messenger. They were communicating via text message. Um, and we see this as the way in. We see this as a door. Uh, and technology opens the door for us to engage, but it's not just to engage. So when we think about families, we think of families as first responders. Treatment is 30 days, uh, and Dr. Compton mentioned too, this is a journey. This is, not, this is not a one and done and we're done. And the people around those recovering, the people around those trying to change are the ones who are gonna have the most impact. Uh, that's both the family and a recovery peer system. And so just to give you a couple of examples of how we're using tech and to think about how we can use it more is, for example, we are, we're part of the crisis, messenger, uh, crisis uh, uh, response over messenger program uh, via Facebook, the CSOM program. And 500, since, since we've increased um, the engagement and since we've, we've been working with Facebook, we have 500 qualified interactions between our specialists and, and individuals, families struggling. That's 500 families a month that are coming to us. And we can, and the, the problem is the reason we're not pushing it out is because we can't handle more. Mm -hmm. So we've been pulling back because we can't handle it because the demand is so much. But people are already on Facebook and we're using them to engage. The same thing with Google. Google is 30% of our traffic to our website and then subsequently our helpline. And what we're doing uh, with our helpline is we're allowing families to connect with us via uh, phone, via Facebook, via text message, uh, uh, via chat, and it's opening those doors using their preferred communication mediums uh, because that's where people are. We communicate. We communicate using these tools. And what we're doing and what tech is doing is how do we curate that relationship? How do we figure out a way to get someone who's there and curate that relationship. I was an outreach worker, and what we used to have to do was go into the field and hand out condoms and hand out, uh, this was during the HIV epidemic, uh, and, and hand out uh, referral cards. And we had to be in there. And what it did, it might not have changed something in the moment, but it was a harm reduction, but it also let people know there was a glimmer of hope. Uh, and we can, we can create that hope through technology. We can create that hope through easy access tools. Uh, one of the other ways we're doing it is through simple text messaging. People can text JOIN to 55753, and they can do one of two things. They can communicate with a specialist right then and there, or they can complete an assessment and get tailored text messages based on 
their own journey. So is their child motivated for treatment? Is their child not motivated for treatment? Are they at risk for overdose or they're not? They can get tailored information through a brief assessment. It takes three minutes. And then we provide text messages for as long as they want. It can be years. Uh, they can type in hope into, the, into the, their text message feed and get messages of hope right then and there. And one of the things that strikes us and one of the things we're hearing from families is that salient reminder, that low burden, low effort salient reminder that tech gives is so powerful. And I think of the phone calls that I've got when I was using uh, as so, so powerful in guiding me just that little touch, little touch, little touch, ongoing touch, 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 and these are our opportunities. Uh, and I think of Tessa's story, and it was, it was great to read Dope Sick and, and, and hear Beth and speak with Beth and, and talk about the journey. And you look at the over opioid prescription. What if there were medication safety protocols in place? What if she knew and there was something that said, you know, and that doctor had the opportunity to give her a guidelines and shifted that. 30 days of two opioids? What if there were alternatives, guides for alternatives, so when she typed in X, uh, alternative medication, alternative for pain treatment popped up. I go to the dentist, I just had two teeth pulled, they were trying to give me opioids, and I finally said, do you want me to go out and do heroin? And jarring. But he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, like is that what you want? Because I said, oh, no, thanks. And it was whimsical. It was nothing. Like, no, I, I, I'm not doing this. And, and, I, and But he didn't give it to me. I was like, Advil's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, and, and these kind of things is we have the power to change this. We have the power to start to change the story. We have the power to empower the individual, inform them through tech as people type in type in something through in, in Google or in Facebook or on Twitter. Um, the access barriers, uh, we can expand Medicaid, but we can also inform people and empower people and give them that immediate and support and guidance um, because not everybody's gonna get into treatment. 50% of people who change don't go to treatment. They don't go to traditional treatment. That means there's a lot of people, there's a lot of things we can do outside of the treatment system to make a change. And tech is one of the number one ways we can engage and hold the hands on the relationship. The uninformed care, Marjorie started this uh, in terms of CSIP and what they're doing uh, with uh, uh, pharmacies, making sure that there's safe pharmacies online. And LegitScript is now working on making sure there's treatment standards and how those treatments are advertised on Facebook, Google, Twitter. So these are things that can be done. Um, in terms of, 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 of treatment navigation, one of the things is parents and family members don't know what to do. Uh, we have navigating the treatment system guides. We have all these things, but we can, we can actually do this and that continuity of care and peer support, peer recovery. We have over 200 parent coaches who either have a child in recovery and some are here today or, or have lost a child. 30% of our parent coaches who are giving back have lost a child. Those individuals want to hold the hands of people looking for help. And what we're doing is we're using tech to guide people to those individuals who are volunteering their time for free to do this. They're coming in via Facebook, they're coming in via Google, and what they're doing, and then, then they speak to a specialist and then they speak to a, um, a parent coach who, who's been there, who understands it. System cycling, there's so many things. Think about tests. I mean, so many touch points in the system where she was in there and the opportunity to connect across those touch points. Uh, 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 Dr. Compton also presented on some of the ED buprenorphine. Um, and, and there are studies to show that when you engage someone right then and there, you're going to improve outcomes after an ED visit or after other visits. And then what we do is with families. Um, uh, the, there's no financial incentive for treatment um, uh, aside from a couple of reimbursed sessions to include family treatment. So most treatment providers don't really do it. So we have to take that into our own hands. We have to do more. There's no reimbursement for parent training, even though we know it works. We know it works. And at the partnership, what we're trying to do is do it remotely. We're doing it via phone. We're doing it via uh, um, uh, web-based interventions. We're doing it via online. 
groups, and other people are doing it too. The Carol Klumpfer studies on strengthening families is, is not necessarily technology, but it's, it, those outcomes are remarkably powerful. Um, and, and then there's the opportunity for families. The one thing that strikes me about Pat and, 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 and Tess and their interactions was that she was a healthcare professional who was completely uninformed about treatment and had biases. And the opportunities that we have to intervene, to, to change the conversation, and, and that tech has to change the conversation and provide that caregiver support. Um, community reinforcement and family training, self-care, natural consequences, things that actually work can be getting in the hands. We're trying to do it. Other individuals are trying to do it as well. Uh, and I just highlighted a couple of things of where tech can make a difference uh, that just stood out to me just really briefly. I mean, they're, they're, I think it can make a difference in all of these. Um, but, but the opportunity to create those connections across the spectrum, to provide that care continuum, um, to, to take the str existing strengths of tech in terms of machine learning, understanding patterns, uh, triggering care, uh, connecting people to other people. This is where the opportunities are. And we're just scratching the surface. We're just getting started. And one of the things that also strikes me before I finish up is the opportunity for that support to be triaged, to allow people who aren't ready necessarily to go to a, a group in their, in their neighborhood. They're not just ready, we know. We know that digital systems are a lot easier to talk to than humans. It's just the way it is. Men report more sexual uh, partners to a human than a computer. Women report fewer. Uh, this is just the way it is. We do not like to speak to people. We would rather do it in a, in, in a digital system, and we have that opportunity. We also know that long-term recovery happens with that connection in the community. So we have to triage people. We have to build and, and help them engage in recovery support systems that will allow them to sustain that long-term recovery. Um, and that is a nice segue, actually, to Justin. Long-term recovery. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You know, amazing author, tech guru, 30-year-old, but that's great. Um, I mean, when I was like 22 and a CEO, that was like, you know, bio-worthy, but now I'm like 30 and people are like, so we'll maybe do some PR work to talk about, enter long-term recovery at 19, and we'll just let people wonder. But um, gosh, I mean, can we, just, can we just take a moment and just really, you know, again, because now we know my age, I've been doing this for, you know, over a decade. This has never happened. I mean, this is tremendous. So I just want to thank everybody who's organized this and put this together. Round of applause. Good job, fellas. You saw where I was going with that. <clears throat> I mean, I remember starting Young People in Recovery with a group of other volunteers spread out through uh, all over the country. And if it wasn't for Google Hangout, Facebook, and Twitter, and then our own personal credit cards, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. And so, I mean, it's just a, it's a huge honor to be amongst um, such tremendous leaders, not only on stage, but the people that put together this event. And I think it's exciting because I only met a few of these leaders, you know, what, in the last couple of months. And oftentimes, I'm sure, I'm sure this is the first event you've been to in D.C. or something like this, where somebody says, and then we're going to, you know, we're going to take action and follow through. But this is already the result of one of those other meetings. And I think that's, that's really, I, I want the audience to know that this, this isn't like a kickoff. It's actually an ongoing continuation of work that's been happening, not only for a few months, but for years now. Uh, the companies that brought us all together today have been you know, creating innovative solutions for people and communities uh, for years now. And I think that's one of the things that, um, as I get to talk about the fancy slide behind me, which I clearly didn't make, we have a team for that. Uh, but before I get into the fancy slide, is really just taking a moment and appreciating that it, if it weren't for companies doing things like this, many of us, myself included, would probably still be you know, um, you know, reduced to kind of hiding in the corner. And you know the stigma and the shame and the you know not being proud of being a person in long-term recovery. You know, I mean, I you know I get to think about the true purpose of what we're doing here today. Um, I like I'm sure many people here today. Uh, who, raise, show of hands, who's been on a plane to fly here, right? Who who flies a little bit now and again every week, right? Uh, I've got my strategy for Southwest to get that magical first-class row seat, you know, in the exit row. Anyway, um, so I do that so much so to where I have a tradition with my four-year-old daughter. 
and I write her a little journal entry, and I make it kind of specific for the day that I'm gone if she wakes up and I'm not home. And you know, for Halloween, you know, the and you're opening with "Boo, Happy Halloween," you know, and that's just a little thing that I can do with her every morning when I'm traveling. I'm not there. And what was really neat is I've said this before, but then being able to write a note to my daughter to let her know it's happening. And that's, you know, we talk about goals. I've, I'm kind of an intense person. I talk to my four-year-old little girl about, you know, goals, excellence, generosity. <laughs> um, she has a regular piggy bank and a generosity piggy bank. So, you know, we're, that's the Riley family. That's how we roll. And so we talk about career and purpose and interest. And so all that to say, she knows what, what, you know, she knows what daddy does for a living. And I've told her for a few years now that my job is to help build the future for her. And it was so nice um, to be able to write that note and not say, you know, daddy's working on that, you know, or that's his goal one day. But, you know, daddy's in D.C. right now working with Google and Twitter and Facebook. And he's building the future for you and little brother. And because, that, because that's what all of this is about, you know. Um, it, it's tough for me to even think about my daughter, Everly Hope, or my son, Wilder Luke, in some of the same you know, situations that you've written about so articulately and honestly. And I know that's what so many of us are here for. It isn't just because it's you know, the thing in the media. For a lot of us know that we've been doing this work well before people knew about it. Um, well before people knew that there was a crisis or, you know, I'm from Colorado, so there was a meth crisis once, um, but meth still exists, you know. So we know that though this is a very serious, timely concern with the opioid epidemic specifically, is we want to really future-proof the solutions that we're coming up with, is what are the creative solutions that we can generate that not only help people specifically suffering with opioid use disorder, but, you know, alcoholism still exists. So how can we make sure that things like prevention treatment and then especially recovery support services, we know what those things mean, and things like on-demand recovery supports that eventually, if you just heard that term for the first time, I'll say it again, on-demand recovery supports is like a thing that we all know what that means. I'm shameless and talk about my kids every four seconds, I'm gonna do it again. My daughter knows that she can like Uber herself a snack, which means daddy Uber me a snack, right? I mean, she gets that. She, she knows that she can Uber a snack if we don't have it, or uh, let's go to Whole Foods, you know, or Amazon can bring me Whole Foods. I mean, she, she gets it. But that's, I mean, she's four, right? And you know, talking about technology and the ease of accessing really awesome things or even cheeseburgers, right? I mean, you can get a degree online. How can we make sure that we're living in a world that the addiction recovery solutions are keeping up with the same speed as the ability to get a cheeseburger in this country. I mean, now Wendy delivers, by the way. I'm like, isn't Wendy's like, uh, you know, simple enough to just get? But if we have figured out that there's enough people in the country that are just, you know, so distraught that they would have to drive through a drive-through, and they figured that out through DoorDash, is how can we make sure that in an instantaneous moment, especially for, I don't know if you've ever hung out with young people face to face, or you call them and they say, what's wrong, text me, is they're so used to this digital experience. And I'm grateful for it, I'm glad. I like actually knowing where my daughter is basically at all times, and that's a whole separate issue. But I like being able to FaceTime her. I like being able to hop into a Google Hangout if she's with the sitter and my wife's somewhere, I'm somewhere else. Those are really things that are important and real for us. And I uh, heard it once said that the best type of technology and I'm not, I'm not the tech guy by any means, if you haven't guessed yet, the glasses could be misleading, but I'm not, <laughs> is that the best type of technology is the technology that you barely know is there. It's just native. It's, you know, like, I can't, you know, imagine, like, trying to figure out how to contact my wife. It's a text. It's a hang It's a FaceTime. It, those things are, we take those things for granted, but apparently there was, like, a time when, you know, cell phones didn't exist, so I've heard, but those are things that we become accust accustomed to. The same way that it is native and normal for people of all ages, particularly young people, to access, you know, things to, um, you know, uh, continually supply their addiction with technology, we have to take that as an advantage of that is where they already are. And so how can we meet them where they are? And Fred obviously just talked at length about some of the things that are already happening. But before I talk about, and I have a whopping two slides, and there's no graphs or anything, I'm just not that guy. But... The other thing I want to throw at you as we get ready to talk about these two slides is a statement that you made at breakfast and then a statement that you said again here, which was, we're helping this many people in, the, in these specific ways, but we found that so many people were reaching out to us, we, had, we couldn't keep up with the demand of supporting them, so we had to pull back. And we're in the same boat. 
You know, people ask us all the time, how do, pe how do people learn about young people in recovery? You know, what's your multi-tiered marketing plan? Or, you know, what's your marketing budget? As if we had one. But because of Twitter grants and things like that, we can do things like that. Um, we can't really get out there and promote because we couldn't keep up with the need. You're, we were in a room full of people that, I mean, innovation is so important and we can come up with new ideas, but right now, today, you've got a room full of people that know exactly what to do right now. And the biggest barrier for what we're doing to move forward is, in my opinion, a lack of what I also, I'm teaching you two fancy terms, on-demand recovery supports. The next term is recovery philanthropy. That's not really a thing. Now, I also don't discredit amazing corporations and um, different pieces of legislation and different foundations that have been awesome trailblazing warriors and individuals that have stepped up to make a big difference in this space. But recovery philanthropy, I mean, if this room doesn't know what that means and we haven't seen it and we don't know the 10 big companies that came together you know, in 2018 to make a difference, the average American doesn't know that, right? And if we want to envision a world where you know, one day, just like the NFL has those little uh, bright pink little ribbons on their shoes, you know, where is that for the addiction recovery movement? Because we're not, we're not up here confused. I mean, with the data's in, the stories are being told, the solutions are here, and a little bit of energy and passion. We, it, we're not, this isn't a, a think tank meeting of, does anybody have an idea of what to do? This is a meeting, and I get really intense and worked up, and I usually walk around, so forgive me, I'm like jumping out of the chair. But this is a meeting where we're letting people know what is working, and we need resources to do more of it. That's it. That's all it is, right? And I'll probably say, oh yeah, round of applause, thanks, Charlie. <laughs> um, but that, that's what this is. But that's why when you leave here, other than maybe you know, saying, gosh, that last guy, everybody else was so great and polished, and then the other guy, clearly he had his espresso this morning. But D someone double, double. had a double espresso, <laughs> and that was just when I was with him. But I got in at 2 a.m., fun fact. But this is, we have to, we, I mean, something's got to shift. Some of us know what to do, and we are doing it. And I'm not here to then criticize the very leaders in this room. I'm indebted to you. But the room has to be pouring over, lined out the street, because people are trying to figure out, sign me up. How can I help? Whether I'm a person in long-term recovery, and I will, I'll donate you know, five hours of my time a week to be in an emergency room, a high school, a library, um, an elementary school, a middle school, a college campus. I will be wherever people are. Right? I will show up and I will give my time because the unique opportunity, it isn't just because I'm a person in recovery because that's when sometimes people don't think I'm as inspiring as I could be because they think that of course I care about this. You're a person in long-term recovery. Of course you think we should work with people in recovery, but just hear me out for a minute and then it'll give the background for the slides is the people in long-term recovery, right? We know that we're losing, you know, what, 70,000 people last year, uh, we lose 200 a day. Those numbers are devastating. I've lost dear friends. 25 million Americans in long-term recovery choose and work their butts off to be in recovery every single day. And one of the things that they do to stay in recovery, many of them, is they give back. They're altruistic because it helps their own recovery and they know that they can help other people as well. So you've got a predetermined you know, um, market of people that already deeply care that we don't need to convince. They're just saying, yes, where do you want me? Yes, where do you want me? How can I serve? How can I help man, you know, uh, again, no technology, digital stations, you know, <laughs> things. How can I use my computer? How can I use my phone? If somebody pings me, I want to help them because it helps me and it helps them. That, that's capacity right there. But when you have the leaders, I mean, there's, you know, like 50 of us in the world that know everything there is to know about this movement saying, we're doing it, but we actually have to slow down because we don't have enough resources. That's a big deal. We need resources. We need more things like this. And that's why I'm so grateful for this because I've never seen anything like it. So now that I've convinced you that these next two slides will be extraordinary, I'll talk about them a little bit, okay? So everything I just said, believe it or not, can be condensed down to one slide. Thank goodness, right? This is a recovery-ready community, a way in which to understand a recovery-ready community is imagine how addiction negatively impacts every facet of a community. I've never flown anywhere around the world, and someone says, no, like, addiction? <sighs> Super helpful for us. Really helps the employment, you know, really helps education. Criminal justice system, we don't even need it. No, we know that addiction impacts so many facets of a community, so it's really complex sometimes. Just do the opposite. You know, the reverse is also true. 
Recovery needs to be at every entry point in a community. It isn't individuals being more ready to be in recovery. It's putting the leadership responsibility on the community. So if people don't have access to treatment, they need it. How do we get it to them? And so we look about, we talk about things in a recovery ready community. Like in the middle there where the, our little logo swirl is, put, your, your, put Everly or Wilder or Tess or your family or your friends or somebody you know struggling with addiction and tell me if these things wouldn't be helpful. Of if we had recovery supports for prevention, treatment, harm reduction, judicial and law enforcement, housing, education, employment, recovery supports, Anywhere where addiction is prevalent, which is everywhere in today's current culture, recovery has to be there. It has to be there, it has to be empowered, it has to be trained, and they are waiting and willing to be a part of the solution. And when I talk about the recovery capital that we haven't yet um, fully, fully tapped into, it isn't just people in long-term recovery. I don't wanna alienate people that aren't in recovery. My mom, I mean, my mom, she is a warrior. She's not in recovery, but I wouldn't be sitting here without my mom. My, my sister, right, genius doctor, right, super awesome, wouldn't be here without her. And so when we talk about the recovery movement, please hear me that this is for everyone. We need you. When social causes or when public health crises occur and it's just the people directly impacted by the issue saying this matters, that's good, but it's even better when you have geniuses on the outside saying this matters too, when you have huge companies saying we have to pay attention to this. And so we can have things like recovery ready communities and at every point in the community, recovery supports exist and there's an on-ramp into recovery supports and there's an on-ramp into many pathways and there's an on-ramp into different types of treatment. Those things have to be the status quo across the country and not, well, depending on who you know and what website you can find, and maybe let me call a friend and we can find a place for you. And then also let's talk about insurance first, by the way. No, I'm not gonna live the next 10 years that that's the standard, that this, if you make it, luck has a huge determinant to do with it. All right, cool. So these are the uh, last slide, unless there are other ones that somebody snuck in there, I don't think so. But three things that you can do walking out of here today. I'm a big actions to be taken person and you can start a, you can start or lead a chapter. Why this is important is because today you can leave here yourself or somebody else and say, you know what, that makes sense to me. I wanna be a part of the solution. You can go online and apply to start a chapter and we exist to support you to deliver recovery supports immediately. So that's something you can do or somebody in your community that you know is somebody look, looking to do more for their recovery in their community, they can start a chapter or they can join a pre-existing chapter. You can also visit our website, you can see all the chapters that we have, and go get involved. Learn about all recovery meetings, learn about workshops, learn about peer recovery services, learn about the different advocacy um, opportunities happening in that community. And then lastly, just like I talked about, even if you're not in recovery, this is not an exclusive little recovery club. We really need everybody in this room to say, you know what, I believe, I'm bought in. You kind of yelled at me, you were a little funny, and you talked super fast and probably went over time. But, <laughs> It's kind of that important to snag a couple extra minutes to make sure that you know that today you can become a young people in recovery supporter to say, you know what, I care about this. I believe that addiction recovery is not a moral failing, it's a public health crisis. I know that organizations that are on stage and in this room today are fighting every single day. And fortunately, because of companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter, they're partnering with industry to really make some in innovative changes for communities all over the country. So leave here, get involved. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna take a little bit of time for some questions because we don't, we wanna take advantage of this panel while it's here. So I'll kick it off and if anyone wants to start with a question, we've got one right here. Hi, how are you? Good morning. My name is uh, Lippy Roy. I'm an addiction, uh, internal medicine, addiction medicine physician based in New York City. Thank you so much for taking the time and creating this space to discuss really a public health crisis. Um, uh, Beth, I just want to say that I, I, I we, our society needs so many more journalists and storytellers like you um, to really talk about this narrative and change the narrative so that we can have more, say, photographs and images, people in recovery who are on MAT. So, so of the 20, of the, of the opiate use disorder, 20%, only 20% are on medications. So we know as, as a doctor who's ex-wavered, who prescribes buprenorphine, 
you know, I, I see the other side, like the people on the stage. I see people who are alive. So I think we all need to do a better job in creating that narrative, having more people that are on medications. So I, I see patients, so I used to be the chief of addiction medicine at Rikers Island. So I wow. know that people, and the people that are in those dorms, those housing areas, they're smuggling in heroin, but they're really smuggling in Suboxone. Right. And so the wardens, they're like, how do we get rid of this Suboxone problem? I'm like, actually how you do it is prescribe more of it. And right. Rikers is one of the few institutions that actually offers it. So we know that, we, and, and like Justin, like, like Fred, we know how to treat opioid addiction. There is no mystery here. Mm -hmm. But the real barrier, I think, and this is where I would love the opinion from all of you here, is really it's, it's addressing the stigma of the 23 million Americans with substance use disorder, only 10% access treatment. If we had a leukemia epidemic, I promise you, my patients would be seeing an oncologist today, mm -hmm. if not maybe tomorrow. Mm -hmm. They'd be getting treatment, they'd be getting chemo, they'd be seeing a radiation oncologist. That does not happen with people with addiction, and that's because they are stigmatized. I can't think of a single other uh, disease in all my years of medicine that where the disease is stigmatized, the patient with the disease is stigmatized, and the treatment is stigmatized. Mm -hmm. Because as you guys mentioned, people think that buprenorphine, methadone are just substitute one addiction for another. So uh, I'd love more ideas in terms of how we can really change that narrative using technology experts here in this room and, um, and just reducing the stigma, really. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you so much for all your work. I mean, it's so rare. Most people in jail and prison get no treatment at all. They come out, they go back to perhaps the dosage that they had used before. They're not, they're opioid naive at this point, and they're done. I mean, frankly. And so many people, at the end of my book, there are some positive stories about people using MAT. Um, there's people in Appalachia who are getting their kids back. They're getting their jobs back. They're getting nursing degrees. They don't want to go on the record. They're the only people in my book that don't want to go on the record because they think people will hold it against them and won't want to employ them. And it's just, uh, it, it's, it, it's a tragedy because we do need to hear, hear those stories. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And, you know, France um, took the waiver away, the buprenorphine waiver away in the 80s. So it's like eight-hour training. The DEA has to sign off. It's a bit cumbersome. It's not awful. But I think the big thing is, you know, when they did that, they expanded their uh, capacity times 10. Over overdoses went down 87%. So, I mean, I don't know what we in this room can do about that, but there are so many examples of things elsewhere that have worked, that if we just had the political will and the lobbying um, and the storytelling um, with, with the kind of work you're doing, um, we, we know what needs to be done. Yeah, thank you, Olivia. I've seen you speak a number of times, do amazing work. And um, uh, I, I, to, to add to that, I, I think, um, a lot of people, uh, particularly with the new NISDA data, get, start to say, hey, there's diversion going on. Look at this diversion. It's increasing. There's, there's more overdoses. Uh, and uh, both speaking personally, but in general, people are typically diverting to uh, uh, help withdrawal, with withdrawal symptoms. They're self-medicating. Uh, and, and so acknowledging what's happening with that diversion uh, and then also acknowledging that some diversion exists, and that's part of that, and that's okay. And then lastly, I think one of the opportunities is we know that medication assistment treatment does better when there's behavioral treatment associated with it. We know that when you support individuals with a range of other services, uh, that they will do better. There's more longer-term maintenance. And if you look at the new for-profit MAT treatment centers, the, the ones that are really doing well are integrating holistic care into the treatment. So this combination, and granted I'm a biased clinical psychologist uh, who, who goes behavioral with almost everything, but, but merging those I think will help because there, there is, and, and I even have this bias of you can't just hand someone something who's, who's, who's trying to change behavior and then it's gonna go away. So how we think about that I think will also change the conversation around MAT. I think it's just also tough to emulate what you don't see. So just really brief and really simple. People sharing their stories of being in long-term recovery and how they're in recovery. You know, tomorrow we're doing an event um, with Twitter, you know, hashtag recovery movement. Those are simple things that really go a long way. I mean, if you don't see other people being in recovery in different ways, how could you know that they exist? 
And tomorrow is one way that we're kicking that off and inviting people to join us in that, whether you're in recovery or you're a part of the recovery movement because you're an ally or a supporter. And you can learn more about that tomorrow at 4. Yeah. No, I just wanted the family, the, you know, just what Pat went through in terms of her not believing in MAT, how important that is as well. So it's not only the individual but the family. Sorry, Marjorie. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we could listen to you guys yeah. all day. So um, they will be here and available during lunch. Sorry if you were going no. to hear some. No. No. Happy. Um, so if you have further questions, feel free to yeah, approach them. They're very approachable. And talk to them at lunch. Um, we're going to move on to the next uh, panel. And thank you guys so much for coming. Okay, so this will be our last panel before lunch. And, um, you know, it was interesting in hearing what they had to say. And I will say in, in my experience of working with the companies on our board is that we're dealing with a lot of human beings. <laughs> and um, I think it's easy when we look at solutions and how we dive into this crisis. I think we've got, hang on, a little bit of transitioning happening here. Um, to, to look at companies or look at institutions or look at organizations in kind of a sterile way without acknowledging all the human beings involved in, in running these companies. And um, I was just talking to my sister-in-law as an oncologist and I was talking to another uh, friend of mine who was a surgeon. And, she's, and, and Beth actually mentions this in her book and I think it's a really important point, but she said we've moved as physicians from dealing with patients to now dealing with healthcare consumers. Because even in pain management, when we think about treating a patient, if we don't give them the medication that they think they want or that they need or that has been advertised, they take to Yelp and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're ripped apart for our practices. So in looking at all these different solutions, it's been interesting even talking to the companies on our board because we've been discovering these challenges as it relates to the opioid crisis in real time as well. Um, an example of this was with Facebook when all of a sudden the fake treatment centers were popping up. They were counterfeiting recovery and that was sort of the new way that criminal activity was resonating online. And so they jumped on board to partner with SAMHSA and help direct people that were looking for treatment to a safe place to do that. But this is requiring real-time innovation. Similarly, uh, when, when uh, Google decided to partner with the DEA on the drug dot drop days, and they, by helping match people through Google Maps to a local drop location, 50,000 people used that tool this year, and it resulted in a million, um, a million pounds worth of um, medicines being uh, acquired this year. So it's, it's real time. So we've got these innovators here with us, an amazing, amazing panel of people. So I'm gonna run through this really quickly. But we have Kevin Martin, who is the Vice President of Mobile and Global Access Policy at Facebook since 2015. Y'all, their resumes are amazing. He co-founded Carmichael Partners, was a partner at Pat, Pat, Patton Boggs, and was a commissioner at the FCC. Um, and also a special assistant to the President for Economic Policy in the White House, uh, and a staff member on the National Economic Council and Deputy General Counsel in the Bush-Cheney in 2000. So um, next we have Michael Beckerman, who is the President and CEO of the Internet Association, and under his leadership, the membership has grown to over 40 internet companies. Uh, he is an authority on internet policy, appears regularly on national television networks and in the news, um, and was recognized in Washington Magazine as DC's top tech titans. We have a tech titan in the house, that's pretty exciting. And, um, and, and also as one of Silicon Valley's top advocates in, in Washington. All right, and y'all feel free to come on up while I'm talking. Okay, Susan Molinari, um, she serves as Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at Google. And she was previously president and chief executive officer of the Washington Group, president at Ketchum Affairs. She also served as a member of Congress and is, was one of the most visible voices in her party and one of the most distinctive members of the House. And I could go on about all of the amazing policies that Susan was responsible for pushing, um, but we would need all day. She <coughs> has written books. She's been on CBS News um, as a 
as a contributor, so we could, it, it's, it's too much to do today, so look her up. It's all good. I mean, it's it was good. really That's amazing. I was more like, than you need woman, to know. <laughs> this woman's amazing. Um, Lauren Colbertson is a manager at Twitter's public policy team. Uh, she's based here in D.C. She leads Twitter's efforts on the opioid crisis, and before that, she was in the U.S. Senate working on statewide campaigns in her home state of Georgia. So thank you guys so much. I'm going to let you take it away. Is it on? Okay. Yeah. Is it? Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks there for joining us. Uh, I'm Sam Baker. I'm the healthcare editor at Axios, uh, and I write our morning health policy newsletter uh, called Vitals. Uh, and it's really great to uh, be with you today and be with such an esteemed panel to talk about uh, such an important uh, issue. And I guess let's just get right into it. I'd love to kind of go down the line here and, and get a brief overview, I hope, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a brief overview of some of the things that, that your companies are doing, some of the initiatives uh, that you're most proud of. And I wonder if, a, a, as you discuss that, uh, you know, if you could sort of put that in the context of what was the thing or the moment or the process or what, what was it that made you realize, oh, there's room for us to be part of the solution here. How did, how did you come to this, you know, in the context of, of what you've done since then? I guess I'll get things started. I'll try to be Twittery and 280 here. Um, so, thank you for having us. We're re really happy to be a part of this. Um, you know, I've been very blessed to meet a lot of folks along the way in, over the last year. Um, I think, for me, um, it's been meeting some of the folks in recovery, including Justin. Um, the more that I learn about their work, the more I am inspired to figure out how we can best utilize um, social media platforms such as Twitter to help educate, empower, and help folks find community. And so um, we've also worked with some of our government partners. Um, so through a variety of partnerships and relationships we've built, um, we've put forth a few, effort, a few initiatives. For example, we've provided a custom emoji for the DEA Take Back Day, and that's resulted in a massive, massive increase in engagement on the Twitter platform, and that helps get the word out. So people go and they turn in their unused or unwanted prescriptions. Um, we've also um, been engaging with nonprofits and NGOs and helping train them to be better users of Twitter so they can reach folks. Um, we're also, I'm really excited to be hosting some of the recovery um, folks at Twitter tomorrow to talk about um, recovery and, and to dispel some of the myths and to educate. So I am not being Twittery, so I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> Okay, I'll try and be Twittery too, even though I'm a former <laughs> member of Congress and we have a tendency to go on and on and on and on. Why is Google here? So let me tell you, this um, predated my involvement in this issue, and I want to call out Michael Trin and Adam Barrera and Coca Pinnell, who have been working on this issue for Google, uh, the two gentlemen since before 2015, um, in terms of acknowledging that when you talk about searching for answers, that there is a, an important <coughs> spot that Google can play, right? The numbers are 60% of people in treatment use the web to find out about treatment. Everything that we've heard about the anonymity of search allows us to try and use our resources and working with people in this room to get the best information to people who are seeking treatment, who are seeking information. There's over 50,000 opioid drug name queries per day that we see on Google. So we feel like we really have an opportunity to use the best, to be the best in class, and helping people connect when they're doing that anonymous search to the people in this room. And like one of those is the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. We do a parents' helpline um, online where um, we've increased the capacity for sending people so when, and we know overwhelmingly, the people who are searching for help are the parents or family members of the opioid users. So if we can push them towards groups like the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids, then we're getting them instant um, connections. And this is an amazing organization where I've just learned the average call, the first call is 45 minutes long, and they'll make, parents will make three to four more calls during the course of, of seeking treatment and figuring it out answers. Think about what happens to somebody who doesn't have anybody answering that phone. So in addition to having a one box when you have that search query, it's the first thing that pops up and we direct them there. We've also helped provide additional monies to help them staff up um, for all the additional inquiries that they get and allow them to function on East Coast and West Coast time so that people aren't um, in the middle of things where you know, they're, they're trying to find an answer and they finally get the courage to make the call. And because they're in California, they have to wait another day. So we're trying to help with that. Um, and also using um, 
our, ad, our ads and YouTubes, um, trying to get PSAs out, trying to promote the people that Beth has talked about, um, that people who have been through recovery and back, putting faces um, and, and, and um, behaviors out there so that we reduce the stigma, working with creators for change, et cetera, using the technologies that our young people go to um, for, for answers, for help, um, in, in providing them the kind of answers and heroes and leaders um, and company for what they may be going through um, at any age. I do want to just say a point of personal privilege because it's not at any age. My dad, now I'm a former member of Congress. My dad was a former member of Congress. He was in a massive car accident when I was like 10 years old where he died on the operating table and, and you know, had really severe arthritic condition and as he got older it got worse. And he was on a whole bunch of medic medicine. Then one day he stopped being able to like tie his shoes and brush his teeth. And I went to doctors throughout the country and some of the best hospitals and said, I, I think this started when he was put on Oxycontin. And I could not get one medical specialist say, yes, that could, that could be. No. They had me looking at um, nursing homes for my dad and tested, tested every area of his brain. Um, he got off Oxy and lived another 20. He just died this July um, um, having nothing to do and was like mentally fine the day he got off Oxycontin. But I think with our political and economic privilege that we had when we were going through this, I couldn't get anybody to help or admit it could be a drug. I don't understand how people in the rest of the country, if we don't do this job, stand a chance. Longer than I'm, longer than Twitter, a little more like Facebook. <laughs> the, um, uh, well, first, I just have to say, whenever there's, uh, I was struck this morning by so many personal yeah. poignant stories that it's just so important for us to uh, end up remembering how, how the crisis really touches everyone and how we're all trying Absolutely. to, uh, how we're all trying to play a part in it, which I think is just so critical. I mean, you ask how Facebook came to it, and I think it actually it just arose out of its underlying mission. This morning, Marjorie talked about the power that technology has to connect. And, and when we started focusing on this issue, actually the Facebook's mission was uh, to how can we make the world more um, open and connected. Uh, and now our, our, our mission is actually how do we end up building more effective communities and what do we do on building communities. And Justin just talked about how uh, that when there is this crisis, there's a built-in community of people that, that are anxious mm -hmm. to try to help others. And I, I just think that it just arises out of, ours, out of, uh, out of our underlying mission. Uh, it's so natural for it. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, we're obviously trying to end up doing our part, and we have a couple of important things. We, we partnered, obviously, with DEA on the, on the Take Back Day. We did, too. Well. I'm and sorry. I forgot did, to you know, say that. Yeah. Okay, we all worked together. <laughs> right, we did. We, we all did. worked on, on using uh, our... Um, and, and, uh, and, and we were fortunate that we heard from Fred on the last panel on what we've been able to do with Messenger, being able to connect uh, those, so many of those families. And he's talking about there's 500 families a day that are now mm -hmm. able to be connected that uh, they wouldn't otherwise have been able to, you know, able to so easily. And so it's those kinds of efforts that I think are so important from us in trying to make sure that, that we're uh, increasing the ability of people to find help when they, when they need it. And, uh, and we're also trying to make sure we increase awareness, not only on the DEA Take Back Day. We also partnered with Shatterproof, who I think is here as well today. There are 26,000 stories about uh, what uh, that, that people are willing to share uh, on Facebook and, and how they're able to then make, uh, make everyone know about it to try to erase some of the stigma that's involved as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then finally, I think as we talked about with building community is, in, and again, as I referenced Justin uh, a minute ago, how important that really is in trying to overcome this crisis. And I think that what we've been able to see, and we partnered, for example, with Facing Addiction, which is one of the, which is a really important uh, a group in this area, and, and, and being able to establish a group to be able to increase the overall awareness, increase the number of volunteers throughout all 50 states. They increased their fundraising over 30 times uh, by our partnership with them. And I think it's, it's all of those efforts that are really uh, gonna go and enable us to try to tackle this crisis. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so representing the industry broadly, um, I have to say I'm very proud of the companies and the industry where this is a problem that largely exists offline. Um, over 97% of people are, are finding opioids from, from friends or doctors or, or places in the offline world. Yet we see all of these companies and the rest of our member companies taking an oversized um, part of the solution and working hard every day with, with the FDA and communities to help solve this epidemic and take a larger share than, than perhaps the internet might contribute. And, and if you think about why that is, I mean, the internet, in my view, is all about, it's about information. You know, think about how you use the internet to get information and, and um, 
and Twitter and, and Facebook and Google here spoke about some of the ways they do. Some of our other member companies like Microsoft work with uh, the FDA and pharmaceutical boards to help identify and educate people about um, illegal online pharmacies and when there are pharmacies that exist online that are problematic, they help flag that, which makes people be more informed and make um, the right decisions and not to use those. Um, but also the internet is about bringing communities closer together. And, and that's what all of these companies are doing. And, and so much of this issue is about, as we heard from some of the previous speakers, is about family and friends and connecting. Um, and through social media and through the internet and, th and through using these tools, we're able to bring communities closer together and be stronger and help find people that uh, maybe have a cry debt for help and maybe can't express themselves in other ways or, or find um, places to get treatment or um, support groups and, and to work together. Um, but again, you know, this is a major issue that all of us are going to have to come together to combat in our families and our communities. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to work with all these companies that are taking an oversized um, piece of this problem on. And we look forward to continue to work with all of you and, and others to, to help solve this. And when you look at the, uh, you know, that line chart that we're all very familiar with of opioid deaths in the yeah. United States, you see this, this crisis uh, change and evolve over the past, really going back maybe a decade. Mm -hmm. um, first with prescription opioids, then heroin sort of spiked, and that was the leading thing, and now it's fentanyl, right. most of yeah. which is illegal, uh, promoting or... or Make it easier for people to find access to treatment would be the, the constant through all that. But mm -hmm. I'm curious, as the nature of the crisis has changed, uh, sort of setting the, the treatment part aside because that would be a constant, has that changed what any of you all have done or have you sort of seen that uh, or has that affected your, your work and your response at all? So I think the take back day is something that, right, was we start to see the, the, the use of, you know, illegal drugs, um, prescription drugs. Um, you know, one of the things I think we've all tried to accomplish through Take Back Day, and you know, we've done it, and we're actually, I don't know if I'm supposed to announce this now, but, but the heck, um, <laughs> as opposed to just two days a year, we're gonna have it constant, so we're working with some of the major pharmacies um, throughout the country, so that if somebody says, where can I dispose of, you don't have to wait for those two days, and between the DEA and, and the major pharmacies, you'll be able, you know, through Google Maps, we'll be able to bring you locations. Now that does a, a whole bunch of things, right? It, it's not the only answer to it, but it does remind people that you know, the way people are getting these drugs are through largely through friends and families according to SAMHSA and the DEA. And so if we can help have that conversation with families through Take Back Day, that's a, that's a really important thing. So I think, again, um, we rely on the experts, right? We rely on the Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. We rely on DEA. We rely on SAMHSA. When we direct people to our sites for, for, for rehab or for information on opioids, which might have been something else five years ago, we're directing them to the Mayo Clinic, we're directing them to HHS, and uh, their messages um, and, and things will evolve. Um, the partnerships that we use have, have pretty much stayed consistent and have ramped up as, as we've realized and gotten more engaged in terms of um, the kind of information that we can provide to people because of their reliance on, on our platforms. You know, one of the things that we announced today was a partnership we have with the University of Alabama, where we're trying to use their research, uh, the research they have there, about what are the latest techniques mm -hmm. uh, that, the, that the people that are trying to be, you know, are hurting our communities with these drugs are using and utilizing. So that we're trying to reach out to experts to be able to inform us about, um, you know, what are the latest street names they're mm -hmm. using for the different drugs, which ones are on the rise, and how we can evolve our techniques in trying to, in terms of trying to identify and remove the content uh, as well. It needs to be informed by those experts, and so that's one of the ways I think we've kind of responded as the crisis. Has yeah, and, and legit script obviously helps us all. You know, we kind of use them as, you know, what's accepted, what's not, both in rehab and pharmace pharmaceuticals. So that that has changed with what they flagged for us. Yeah, we've, re we've relied heavily on partnerships, not only with each other, but with experts. Yeah. And we've had a similar experience working with government experts. Um, we've received lists as we're working on increased enforcement. Also with recovery, I think there is a lot to be learned about recovery that I think the general population doesn't, doesn't know. And so I think there, I've talked to researchers at various universities. We've had kind of an informal working group and we're using their expertise to help drive our product and enforcement changes. You all are in sort of a unique place to see demand, I guess, mm -hmm. in real time. Um, the, the 
part of this where our worlds overlap that I've covered the most was in advertising, which was first of all suppressing ads for illegal pharmacies, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know using some of these new tools when people just search sort of a generic term to surface treatment resources for them. So to the extent that you sort of see demand coming in for whatever illegal drug it might be, or demand for treatment, do you feel like things are getting better? Hmm. Oh, who in this room wants to say yeah. that? But we don't want to say it's getting, I mean, look, I think, yes, I think it's getting better because we are having these conversations, right? I think that's really important. Um, I think we still have so, so far to go on, on all these aspects of, of warning people to the dangers of, um, of finding treatment, of finding the right rehabs. You know, I mean, there's just a challenge every inch along the way, right? Um, and so, you know, I mean, I, it's hard to say things are getting better when we look at, you know, the number of deaths that surpass, you know, most of our major wars um, on any given year. So I, I, I want to be hopeful, um, but the numbers and the stories and the people in this audience make that a, a little difficult. I think if there's a place to be hopeful, it's that we can come together and have this conversation about the fact that it is brave and courageous to seek help. And you know, those are, that's the attitude we need to be taking as a society. And I see we're making a slow turn to that. So if there's a positive side, I think it's because people like Beth and others, and hopefully what we do, are helping to put a face to say it's every one of us. Um, and so you know, the stigma part is at least taken away, because if we don't do that, the numbers don't get better, they get worse. Yeah, that was a happy note. Okay, yeah. thanks. <laughs> I know, it gets pretty grim. <laughs> and, and, and this affects a lot of our families, and so for a lot of us in the, the tech companies, it's personal. For me, it's personal. Um, one thing that I'm really encouraged by is, I, I keep going back to the recovery mov movement, but I think that's really where I find a lot of hope. And I think it's so important what Justin said is that the recovery movement isn't just for people in recovery. The recovery movement, in order for it to be effective, it's for all of us to join it and to say, you know, we love, we support people, um, and we're here, and, and we want to help. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help bolster that movement and to use our platforms to help them um, with their work. I think that there's probably others, uh, other experts here who are better able to talk about whether the crisis is getting better or not. Um, and, uh, but it, but as, as Susan said, with the numbers you see on the charts, uh, it, it's hard to, to make those kind of conclusions. I, I think what is getting better is certainly our coordination, uh, whether it's the announcement we made today or the other things that we've all done. Uh, to, to try to make sure we're yeah. coordinating effectively. I think the other component that is getting better is that technology is able to help, is getting better to help us to be able to do this. We, you know, we're able to use uh, technology to begin to proactively detect uh, but, you know, both mm -hmm. images and signals about what's going on uh, and the, co the combination of the coordination and the technology increases enables us to, to, to be more effective uh, at what we're doing, both in, in terms of trying to um, stop illegal sales, but it also in trying to reach out uh, to the communities as well. So I, I think there are th components of it that yeah. are getting better, even if, even if I don't think we're capable of saying whether the crisis is or not. Yeah, I mean, and certainly, um, you know, data is an important point on, on, on fighting some of this, but um, it would probably also be interesting to look at, and I don't have those statistics, and our companies wouldn't have these statistics either, but um, when you look at the prescription opioid issue, how many pills are being produced by the pharmaceutical companies every year, and then how many, how many are being prescribed by doctors every year, is that going up or down, and, and why? Um, you, know, the, you know, doctors need to be better educated, and certainly um, online platforms are a great way to educate, but um, I'd like to see uh, the medical community, and particularly the pharmaceutical community, um, do a little bit more to deal with that side of the issue before we even get into recovery. Yeah, I, I want to follow up on that, and I think this will probably be our, our last question, but um, I, I think your point is well taken that this is an offline problem. You know, this is not, it would be unrealistic for anyone to expect Silicon Valley to solve the opioid crisis. I think that's, but, but as you've gotten more involved and undertaken some of these programs, are there any sort of things like that that you've seized on and said, look, now that we're mm -hmm. looking at this, here's what needs to happen broadly, whether that's yeah. you, something the government needs to do, mm -hmm. pharma, like has, has this experience given you, do you feel like any unique insights into broader change 
that would help turn the tide here. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I, I, I have this recurring theme here, and I, I look at this in three buckets. One is prevention, second is intervention, and the third is recovery. And I think tech can play a role in all three of those buckets. And prevention, it's helping with education, working with DEA on take back day. When it comes to intervention, it's the search prompt feature. It's providing those resources or directing folks to SAMHSA and the partnership. And then in recovery, it's also providing the resources or providing the platform for folks to get together and to help each other. So I think um, those also require partnerships, as I said. So um, I, for me, that's been very eye-opening to see that there's not just one part to this. There's really three, in my, in my view. Yeah, and I guess I, I would add to that, like, it's also, <laughs> there needs to be a campaign, right? I mean, I come from politics, so to me, every answer is a campaign. But this has to be a, a long campaign that everybody has to take responsibility for. I love the fact that, you know, where, you know, YouTube is, you know, so prominent amongst particularly the 18 to 49-year-olds, and we're getting very involved in terms of, you know, bringing in the Truth Campaign and other campaigns for, for free ads and, and using our, our creators to help get that message out there because it's going to take all of that all the time to have this conversation to say this is serious stuff and it's not going to go away unless we all take a holistic view to how we stop this or make it better or give hope and uh, you know I think that's it, that is the narrative that is up to all of us in this room but particularly those of us who have a larger role um, or ability to help with that narrative to continue that. I mean, I think the only thing I'd add is that one of the things that, I, that I've observed that um, we, we do need to find a, a way to address is the stigma attached. And I think yeah. one of the things that, that we've been focused on in terms of our educational and awareness campaigns that, we, that, that we've referenced or, or what we do with groups, uh, like, like we talk about the facing addiction where they're getting their stories out or Shatterproof where they're getting the, you know, thousands of stories out, is, is that that's going to be really essential to, to addressing the stigma and to ultimately get beyond this. I think that's what we're going to do. And helping the families, right? We keep hearing from people when you have the family support, but who the heck knows what the right thing is to do under those circumstances, the families. The families. The families so, the, so, but yeah. right. But but to be able to give you as many resources as possible to have faith and confidence in your decisions when you're when yeah. you're so scared, right? But the family on the other side, like Justin, Justin yeah. in recovery, he knows the, family, the mothers of children yeah. in recovery. We know because we know what we did wrong. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. critical, yeah. and we want to help them to find you. So thank you. I mean, you know, touching on on Susan's point and, and and Kevin's point. I mean, one on um, one of the great things about the internet. I mean, it does help, I think, reduce um, stigma that are uh, stigmas that are attached to different um, issues where you can. And sometimes young people in particular feel a little bit more free to talk on the internet using social media, but even silently learning and hearing what you can find mm -hmm. online through all of these different platforms, and that addresses it. Um, and then also on the campaign point, um, Susan's 100% right. I mean, I remember as a kid, there was like that very active, like, say no to drugs and the drug ca campaigns, and um, that's something that um, all of our members are working on now through the Ad Council and some of the campaigns yeah. that... Um, that all of these companies and some of our other members have contributed to, I think, are very, very powerful. And they're going online and they're going offline. But um, you know, looking at each one of these stories, it's it's you know people that you know could be any one of us or family members or friends in the community who you know maybe went into the doctor's office with you know a simple in injury and then are prescribed um, something that they were not aware is highly addictive and, and problematic, and then this thing spirals out of control. And the more people are aware of that in the front end. Um, doctors and patients can make smarter decisions, and then we can also um, work on the road to recovery together. But I want to thank everybody for being here today. This is, yeah. we're really, I, when I walked in and saw and looked at the list of the people who are here um, and how many of you are here, it's, it's really gratifying. So thank you all for taking time and traveling to be here with us. And we look forward to hearing from you as to how we can do these things better. Well, I think Thanks. that wraps it up. Uh, thank you, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.